How's it going everybody? Mr. Bear is here and welcome to the beginner's guide. Now, in case you guys do not know, the beginner's guide is a narrative first person kind of exploration game. I don't it's kind of guided, but at the same time you could choose your own path and directions that you want to take. So it's not like open world kind of like a Vanishing Beat the Carter, but it's kind of like the Stanley Parable series, kind of like that. It was supposed to be really interesting, and I just decided, you know what, what the heck, let's try it out. So, uh, I don't really know exactly what it's about, but let's go ahead and jump right into it. And please make sure your audio is on. I believe it is on. Um, I got closed captioning on. WASD and controls. Oh, gotta put my phone on silent. <laughs> good thing, good thing that, uh, went off at the beginning there. Hi there. Thank you very much for playing The Beginner's Guide. You're welcome. My name is Davey Reedon. I wrote The Stanley Parable. There we go. And while that game tells a pretty absurd story, today I'm going to tell you about a series of events that happened between 2008 and 2011. Okay. We're going to look at the games made by a friend of mine named Coda. Now these games mean a lot to me. Uh, I met Coda in early 2009 at a time when I was really struggling with some personal stuff and his work pointed me in a very powerful direction. I found it to be a good reference point for the kinds of creative works that I wanted to make. So just to start you off, this is, I think, the first game he ever made. It's a level for Counter-Strike. You can walk around here, by the way. And uh, mostly it's just Coda learning the basics of building a 3D environment. But what I like is that even though he starts from the simple aesthetic of a desert town, he then scatters these colorful abstract blobs and impossible floating crates around the level. And of course, it destroys the illusion that this actually is a desert town, and instead this level becomes a kind of calling card from its creator. It's like a reminder that this video game was constructed by a real person. And it kind of makes you wonder, what was going through his head as he was building this? This is what I like about all of Coda's games. I mean, not that they're all fascinating as games, but that they are all going to give us access to their creator. I want us to see past the games themselves. I want to get to know who this human being really is. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. So, it's 2008, Coda starts making these games, and he never releases any of them. He doesn't put them onto the internet, he just makes them and then immediately abandons them and they sit on his computer forever. And I think he really understood this image of himself as a recluse. Uh, at one point, he jokingly renamed his computer's recycling bin to Important Games Folder. <laughs> so, you know, this was just how he worked. He tended to crank them out one after the other without even really pausing to try to understand what he had just made. Until suddenly one day, he just stopped. In 2011, that was it. He made his last game, and then he hasn't made another one since. And that's why I've taken this opportunity to gather all of his work together. is because I find his games powerful and interesting, and I'd like this collection to reach him, to maybe encourage him to start creating again. And if the people like you who play this also happen to find his work interesting, then I'm sure it'll just send that much stronger of a message of encouragement to Coda. So thanks for joining me on this. If you have a particular interpretation that I haven't mentioned here, or if you just need to get in touch, you can email me at d-a-v-e-y-w-r-e-d-e-n at gmail.com. Okay, that's about it for introduction. Let's take a look at Coda's first proper game. As each game is loading, I'll show you the date that it was completed. This first one was made in November 2008. That is really cool, because I didn't, when it said narrative, I didn't think it'd be, like, directly talking to you like that. But that is very cool I was directly talking to you. As opposed to the Stanley Parable series, where it's, uh, not exact... What? This game is called Escape from Whisper, and it's one of the more generic games you'll see from Coda. Okay. All right, let's do this. Oh, shit. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. It kind of looks like this game was abandoned mid-development. 
For instance, you have this gun, which you'd think would indicate that there are supposed to be monsters or enemies somewhere, but then clearly there are no enemies anywhere. You can't even reload the gun when you run out of bullets. But ultimately we don't really know. Maybe Coda thought that actually it was complete the way that it is. And I think that we should talk about his games for what they are, rather than for what they're not. Enemy force neutralized. Begin shooting activation. All right. So he's kind of talking about his friend and his game. So this game is kind I of love how you for can Coda. See the bottom of the universe from this room. <laughs> That's cool. Apparently, this space station has a labyrinth on it. I... Uh, sure, I don't know. There's really no reason for it that I've ever been able to discern, so in the interest of time, I'm just gonna skip you on past it. Dang it. Thank you, though, for saving me the trouble. Okay, this is the part that's interesting. The game has this narrative about the whisper machine and how it has to be turned off, and then you get to the engine room. Hey, you there, in the engine room. You could save us all. That beam is powering a whisper machine. We could disrupt it by introducing a great enough heat signature. If you... Your body could stop the beam. It's so much to ask, but for all of our lives, would you do it? Could you give yourself? I guess so, yeah, why not? Huh. Whoa. I just put my... here for a second. Put my what head. you just experienced stepping into the beam and then dying is probably what Coda had initially intended when he was developing this level. But when he first compiles and plays it, something goes wrong. There's a bug somewhere. And this is what happens instead. Oh, so I'm supposed to do it again? Oh. Oh. Okay, then. The beam causes you to start floating. And this is an important moment for him. Because yes, this is technically a glitch, but Coda identifies something human about it. Like how small it makes you feel in the face of this larger chaotic system. Or this floating could be the afterlife, a peaceful place, juxtaposed against all of the hysteria that you've just had to traverse. I, I don't even know. Uh, I have no idea what he was thinking, but what's clear is that after making this, something lodges itself in his brain. He wants to do more of these really weird and experimental designs. So he stops work on this and moves on to a stream of tiny little games that go in all sorts of directions. Let's go ahead and take a look at the first game he made after leaving this one behind. All right, let's check it out, shall we? Ooh. That's a brick. I can't move. But I can jump and crouch. Okay. So try walking backwards. Oh. Yep. In this game, you can only walk backwards. Okay. The past was behind her. Interesting. All right. Wait, whoa. Pass is behind her. Oh, what the fuck? All right. We could do this. There we go. Uh-oh. So it's a short and relatively minimalist experiment the future... combining motion and narrative. It is less advanced than the previous game, but actually it seems to be more focused, more complete. Code is trying to give it a unique voice rather than simply basing it on a pre-existing trope. The future could not be seen. Fuck. Alright. Let's take a left then. Let's go this way. When when she steps and looks. But if the future is always behind her. How will she find the strength to confront it? It's a short little thought, it says what it wants to say, and then it ends. Didn't need anything more than that. That's really neat, Which, actually. Which, to me, is why it works. Because it gets out quick. 
Okay, next one. All right then. I'm liking you so far, Coda. You seem like a pretty cool guy. A deep guy. You are now entering. Now entering what? And that's it. Okay, the meaning of this game won't be clear just yet. Please be patient with me for a few more games and I promise you'll see what makes it interesting. All right. I'll trust you on that one. This seems really cool though. Nonsense. Oftentimes, Coda would put bizarre titles like this one at the start of his games. Oh, whoa. All right. I wish I'd known him at the time that he was making these early games. See what he, he would really only talk to me about his work as he was making it. Once he stopped work on a game, like, that was it. It was dead to him. And I don't agree with that at all, but what are you going to do? Yeah, what are you going to do? Ah, uh, let's see what you got to throw at me today, Coda. Oh, I'm walking slower. Once you've been slowed to an absolute crawl, the door at the top of the stairs opens. So why, if Coda's not showing these games to anyone, why bother opening the door at all? Well, to show you, I'm modifying the game here so that when you press enter, it'll bring you back up to full speed so you can enter the door for yourself. There we go. Alright, hit it again just for threes. Press U to surrender, plays to camera filming, and advise walking around. Whoa! Sharks are trying to eat you. Simultaneously, you are trying to eat the shark. Read an enemy's emails to learn how to beat them. A room that's warm and nice and filled with little ideas for games. Coda would often tell me that he didn't mind if people thought of him as cold or distant. He said that he knew that he was actually a vibrant and compassionate person, but that it takes time to really see that. It can be a very slow <laughs> climb one. to get there. Play as a pair of floating eyes emitting footsteps noises. <laughs> mm -hmm. Alright. That's neat. Ready, set, fish. Always got to do a pano to see uh, what we got, right? Some of these are kind of laggy for me. Like, that last one wasn't a little laggy. And this one's just a tiny bit laggy. Like, just a tiny bit. I don't know if you guys can notice it in the recording, because sometimes you can't. But for me, it's just, just a little bit. Well, this is new for Coda. It's an actual puzzle. Go ahead and see if you can solve it. Of course I could solve it. I could solve any puzzle. Let's go this way. This is where the smoke is going, right? Oh shit! Don't forget that solution because we're going to see this puzzle again soon. All right. We're gonna see it a lot. All right. Going to see it a lot, he says. All right. I like the narrator's voice too. Pretty nice. I like how this guy. So that seems to be it, right? You walk down a corridor, you solve a puzzle, you get to the end. Simple enough. Alright, now I'm going to modify the game again so that when you press enter, it'll remove all of the walls from this room. Oh, okay. But this is something the people in the game won't see. How about that? There was more to it than we had any way of knowing. I actually find it funny that this game comes after the stairs game, since they essentially convey the opposite idea. What? So, uh, in the stairs game, a dull exterior concealed a rich interior. And then, in this level, a dull interior hides this fantastic outer world. Either way, I think that the point is the same. Is that most of the time, you don't get to know what you're missing. Or even that you're missing anything. That's not your role oh, as a player. Yeah. So if your role here is not to understand, then what is it? Jeez. Okay. I like how we're playing a game, and inside that game, we are playing a lot of games. Aha. Uh -huh. So this, combined with the entering game from earlier, tells us that Coda believes his games are connected somehow. 
It could even be that the stairs game and the puzzle game are literally connected in between this and the entering game. There's a bigger picture that all of his games are meant to play a role in, some larger meaning that we won't be able to grasp until we've seen all of them. And once we have, we can step back and start to understand what exactly that bigger picture is. All right. The bigger picture. The Great and Lovely Descent. As opposed to the Dark Descent. Whoa! That's bright. That's very bright. All right. Let's talk about video game development for a second. Every video game runs on what's called an engine, which determines what the game can and cannot do. So in other words, the engine is a set of tools for game development. The Stripwise Fool. To make all of these games, Coda is using an engine called Source. Like all engines, Source has certain things that it does well, and it has certain things that it does poorly. One of the things that it does very well is boxy linear corridors. Crap. That's why so many of Coda's games are set in these large, flat, empty rooms, is just because he's working with what the engine does well. I want to get to that. The tools to available to the creator shape what kinds of creative work they're going to end up making. You might consider paying attention to the architecture in Coda's games, to notice how they seem to stem from an engine that's very good at producing linear boxy corridors. All right, I'll pay attention to that. Linear boxy corridors. All right, Coda. Oh crap, I'm guessing I like can't fall. Oh crap. Oh crap. Uh. Oh, wow, okay. That was a lot quicker way of going down than I, uh, would have thought. What is this thing? Is that just keep going? Just keep going? Yeah, alright, I want to see if maybe, like, what is that? That's just a light or something? Whoa. Oh, okay. What is this? Like, Slaughter house. It's kind of scary. What are those noises? Oh, all right. Guess I'll get in. Oh, oh, okay. I'm jumpy right now. I don't know why. But I'm jumpy, alright. Probably because I'm expecting something scary in a game like this to happen. This prison, funny enough, in Coda's original design, the door stayed shut for a full hour before letting you go. If you don't mind, I think we're gonna skip that. Oh. This is something that he and I used to argue about a lot. You know, whether a game ought to actually be playable. Whether it means anything if no one can get through it. And I would always defend that, you know, all this work goes into the game, why not make it playable and accessible? And so we just got into heated arguments over it, and there was one time that after one of these conversations, he went home, and a day or two later, he sent me a zip file entitled Playable Games that was full of hundreds of individual games, each of which was just an empty box that you walked around in and nothing else. Believe me, I played every single one of those just to find out if there was like a gag hidden somewhere. There wasn't. This guy seems really philosophical. So, that's really interesting. This thing, not many people have probably heard about this guy. But at the same time, this game seems like it'd be a game that's actually played a lot. So... It's the puzzle again. With the exact same solution as the last time. So obviously, uh... People probably know about this Coda guy because of this game. There's still no clear indication of what makes this puzzle so special that Coda is going to return to it over and over. But I promise I'll share with you my interpretation very shortly. All right. I really like this so far. This is really, again, boxy corridors and stuff. This is really cool. I like this narrated thing. It speaks directly to you almost as if, oh. Listen, we're, 
You there, did you come from up above? Here, Coda begins using a kind of dialogue system that he fashioned out of the engine's chat capabilities. Use the one, two, three buttons on your keyboard to respond. Two. That's the world above. Been there. To get through a puzzle with two doors and switches. Uh, one, yeah. Again, perfect. Now please tell us how you solved it. Tell us the solution. Tell us how to get to the other side. I, I don't remember how I solved it, but I'm trying to remember, but I can't. I didn't solve it. Someone else let me in. Trust me, you don't want to go over there. Two. You didn't solve it. So you have learned nothing. You cannot help us escape this prison. You aren't the one I need. Sure, surely there will be someone else. Alright. Sorry I couldn't help you out, man. It's a shame. Alright. That so you couldn't actually tell them how to escape. Nope, now we're here again. Hello, how did you get here? Was there a puzzle you had to pass through? Uh... Alright. No, no, we actually found the black space between the doors to be far more interesting. Have you seen it yet? Why would I care about the space in between the doors? Actually, now that you mention it, I remember feeling strange as I passed through it. I don't recall a space between the doors. Alright. I'll try to appeal to their actual side. Don't think too hard about it. You'll see it again soon. Okay. Interesting. What do we get? What, do, what else do we have here? This is a really interesting game. And so we make one last descent down to the final floor of the level. Boxy corridors again. I'm gonna move a little closer to my mic here. There go. Okay. Let me get a. It's a lamp post. Good view of that. Okay, I can't tell you quite why, but for some reason, Coda fixates on this lamp post. It's going to appear at the end of every single one of his games from here on out. I'll tell you what I think. Uh, I think that up to this point, you know, he's been making really strange and abstract games with no clear purpose, and maybe you can only float around in that headspace for so long. Because now he wants something to hold on to. He wants a reference point. He wants the work to be leading to something. He wants a destination, which is what this lamppost is. It's a destination. We're going to see it in the work as well. His games are just going to become a lot more cohesive, a lot more fully developed, with more of a clear idea behind them. And as we go, that idea will get clearer and clearer and clearer. All right. Oh, reach it. Ah, there we go. I, I'm, that's really interesting. This whole thing. Very abstract, like he's going on about. This game is connected to the internet. As you walk around, you can leave notes. The notes you see are left by other players. All notes you see are left by other players. can't read it so first off I'm sure you can deduce this but this game is not connected to I the internet all of the notes that you're gonna see have been written by Coda this was actually the first game of his that I ever played this was shortly nice after room. I met him at a weekend game jam in Sacramento where I grew up I saw him working on this very level and it was just so different from anything that anyone else was doing so right away I was like I have to be friends with this person. <laughs> In retrospect, I think I was probably a bit too pushy trying to get his attention. Uh, I was over-enthusiastic. But he was very gracious about it and very patient with me. And I cooled off eventually. So this is kind of how they oh, met them. Feel free to skip over any of these notes if they're not doing anything for you. Nothing extra is going to happen if you read all of them. Either way, to me they convey a sense of loneliness. I see this person who's filled with thoughts and feelings and beliefs 
and has no way to express them except as scattered and unheard voices in a game that wasn't meant to be played. Oh my. But it's ironic, isn't it? That in playing this game and seeing how alone Coda often felt, that we get to know him better and actually kind of connect with him. And I have to be honest with you, this idea is really seductive to me. That I could just play someone's game and see the voices in their head and, and get to know them better and have to do less of the messy in-person socializing. I could just get to know you through your work. I think this is why I always liked Coda's games so much, is because it felt like they let me have that connection. I felt as though he was inviting me personally into his world. And then I feel less lonely too. Okay, so I guess I just read all those notes. I don't. What am I? What do I do now? I guess I just run around, right? Might as well. This is very interesting, though. After this one, I think I'm just gonna continue on. Just because. I can't. I have to read them. Alright, you know, let's continue on. You guys might want to read all this, but... Oh, can I fall? I can't. Just continue walking around, then. Well, this door looks mysterious. Open sesame. No. Do I type? Open sesame. Uh, me. Make game includes door. Cannot open door. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Let's continue on. Whoa! What is that? That's actually the most colorful thing I've seen in this game, at least. This is actually really cool. Like how this guy just makes these games, and to most people, it just like seems like a pointless, stupid game. This guy's actually like interpreting what he thinks the game means, and that's just his interpretation. To me, they seem pretty good and accurate, but that's just really interesting, I think, in my opinion, how this works out. Like how he makes this game talking about this guy who makes games, and you play those games as he narrates them, basically, and tells you how important they are. Alright. Very interesting. Let's continue on then. Looks like the narrator has abandoned us for now. Unless I have to go around and read each individual message. That would be terrible. Alright. At the end of this level, we're going to see the puzzle again. And here, I'll tell you what I think the puzzle means. Each of these games represents an idea that was on Coda's mind at the time that he was making it. And the puzzle is a way of closing the door on a previous chapter of his life before moving on to the next one. Oh. In each of his games, after exploring a theme that, you know, he might find difficult, Coda can then place this puzzle that he knows has a reliable solution, he understands exactly how it works, and so it gives him a simple mechanism for moving on. Puzzle's not And because there's this dark area between the doors, a space between spaces, before you move on, you get to pause. Just for a moment, a few seconds to reflect on and let go of the events that led you here. To step back and connect the pieces together to grasp at that elusive bigger picture. Right. Got one soul message. One person who could create this. Oh man. What does that sound? How do you leave notes? <laughs> oh no. That's a lot of typewriter noises. Jeez, okay. Um, are you there? Please say something. 
It can't be anything. I just need you to say something. Talk to me, please. Why are you having so much difficult? Talk, speak, 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 speak. Oh man, the typewriters are still going. All right, they fade away. Porn stars die too. Okay, this one is tough. It's gonna kind of just spin its own wheels for a few minutes. Hang with it. All right. You know what, guys? I think I'm gonna end it for this episode. Oh, you could skip the level. I wouldn't want to. Why would you want to do that? All right. As always, guys, I really hope you're enjoying this. I think this is a really neat game, just because I haven't played many games like this with the narrative style that is really like this, where it's actually a person talking directly to you as opposed to really telling a story and like that so it is really different from the parable stanley parable series i thought it would be more similar this is actually really cool i'm enjoying this i hope you guys like this uh as always if you guys like the video make sure to hit that like button subscribe for more content and i will see you guys in the next episode peace